Good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Agazi, and I'm the Teacher Development Manager for Macmillan Education International Curriculum. Today we have Debbie Roberts, who is our science author and expert, who will be delivering a session focusing on planning collaborative inquiry-based activities, particularly um, while we're still, in, well, most of us are still in the sort of quarantine uh, period at the moment. If you have any questions, feel free to write them in the questions or the chat box that you will see. Um, and if you have any audio issues or any technical issues, I'll do my best to help you if I can at all. Um, and I will pass it over to Debbie now. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, welcome, welcome. I hope we're all surviving and coping with whatever stage of our quarantine we're in. Um, initially, for this session, we wanted to look at inquiry-based learning and planning for inquiry-based learning. But because we're not all back in school full-time, I thought it probably would be more useful to look at some techniques and strategies to actually develop inquiry-based learning, but not from the classroom. So I've put some things together based on um, my experience over the last couple of months, and I hope you like them and I hope you uh, can use them. So the main focus for the webinar, my main session objective, is to just support you all and provide some continuing support for parents, carers, and children because these times are challenging and they're very unusual. And um, we just wanted to make sure that you feel fully supported and it's a continued support, not just a one-off. So my main message would be, just relax. We are starting to see the end of this, I hope, being positive. So that's the main, that's the main message. So let's have a look at what we're, we're gonna look at and focus on this morning. Just to reiterate, they are unusual times. We haven't got any experience of this. No one's got experience of a global pandemic like this. There isn't a rule book. No one can really advise us. It is pretty much playing it by ear and, and just hoping for the best. As teachers and parents, we've got to use our instincts and to follow our instincts. There's nothing else we can do. Our main ambition and focus is to support children and to make sure that they get the best that they possibly can. And that's our main, main focus. That's the only thing that we can really do. But we must remember we're not machines. We're talented, we're amazing, we're very educated, we're very um, well-trained in what we do, but we aren't machines. So let's use our skills. Let's use them to the best of our ability. And let's make the best of this time that we possibly can. Let's just have fun and get to know each other albeit from a distance. I probably wouldn't be speaking to you if it hadn't been for this virus. So let's let's make the most of it. So the key points are that globally, we're all in the same situation. We're all in this together. We are all in the same situation. Some of us might be further out of quarantine than others. Others might be deeper into it at the moment, but ultimately we're all in the same position. We're all in a restricted life. So I want to consider collaborative learning for students in this session. And you might think collaborative learning, collaborative learning means to work together towards an outcome, towards a goal. So how can we do that? Socialising is a massive part of student life. It's a big part of school life. Students learn social skills, they learn to interact with each other, they learn good manners, they, need how, they learn how to be responsible for other people. They spend a lot of time together. They socialise before school, during school, at break times, after school. And all of a sudden, and quite quickly, with not a lot of forewarning, that ended. Children and young people have not spent much time together or no time together at all with their friends or their peers for now months. Some of us are moving into months now, not weeks. They've not had that social inter interaction for a long time. My concern and my question is, what impact does this have on students? We know what impact social distancing is having on us as, as adults. Uh, we know that it's not always a very positive thing. My question is, what impact is this having on children? 
the chances are that you are not your child's teacher. If you're a parent trying to homeschool your children, even if you're a qualified teacher, you're probably not the teacher of that child. And if you are a teacher and you're teaching children, because some schools are teaching limited amounts of children, or you're homeschooling children, or you're working online with children, they're probably not the children that you would normally teach. A lot of teachers are coming to me, especially over the last few days, and saying that they're teaching a, a range of children, a variety of children that they wouldn't normally teach. And so that's difficult as well. So remember, you have the honour of being a parent, and that is a very crucial role, but you're not their teacher. So my message would be, don't try to teach them. Don't teach them content because someone else will have to pick up the pieces later on. It's better that all the children are in the same stage. They're all in the same place in terms of education. Whenever I'm teaching or training teachers in inquiry-based learning, because I am an inquiry-based learning specialist, so therefore I work a lot with um, running CPD sessions. I work with trainee teachers, teachers, qualified teachers. I work with people who train, teacher trainers, and I work with ministries of education. And whenever I run courses, I always ask, what do you think the skills are that children need in order to become successful inquiry-based learners. Notice I'm not saying science inquiry-based because inquiry-based learning affects children in all different subject content. It's cross-curricular and it's also life skills. And at the top of the list of these skills, which does grow, it evolves, it changes every single training course. I add, I take ideas from teachers and I add to the list. The list at the moment would probably be about 30 skills uh, one side of A4, but at the top of the list, every single time, is collaboration and communication. And interestingly, up at the top of the list also is always research, and that's global. It doesn't matter where I'm working in the world, collaboration, communication, and research are always, always at the top of the list. So the reason collaboration is so important is because it develops and encourages other skills, skills that can be used in life situations. My son recently said to me, you taught me skills that I use every day. And he recently bought an apartment, his first apartment, and he used skills that actually he'd been taught um, as part of inquiry-based learning. So it's not just for a stage in your life, it is a life skill, it's for the rest of your life. Collaborative learning actually encourages problem solving. Problem solving is a key skill, especially for children in this day and age. Technology is moving at an extremely fast pace and it's a pace that really we can't keep up with. We don't know and we can't predict, we can't forecast what children will be doing in their careers. We don't know what young adults of the future will be doing as a day-to-day -day job. So all we can really do is teach skills. A colleague of mine once told me that he wanted to impress his geography teacher. And so over the summer break, he learned where every single country was on a map of the world. He identified every country. He could recognize the flag for that country and he could state the currency of that country. How impressive is that? How much information is that to take on board? And completely pointless. Most of those countries don't exist anymore. Very few of the flags are even used and the majority of foreign currency has completely changed. So there's no point teaching content like that because it will become obsolete. It might change, it might stay the same, but the chances are it will change, but the skills never change. Problem solving means that a student could go into a situation and using information could figure out what the flag of that country is, could work out what currency that country 
users through a simple Google search. So it's better that a student knows how to use the internet than it is to memorise information. Collaborative learning encourages resourcefulness, so students can actually figure out for themselves. They can work things out using what they've got. They can become a team player. They know how to communicate. They know how to collab collaborate as a team. They know their role, which could be the leader, or it might not be the leader. But leading is a massive responsibility. When I'm training teacher trainers, I always say, you need to be at least, at least one step in front of the students. So if you're teaching primary school, really, you should need to know that subject that you're teaching to the next level. So being a, a leader, you need to know more. You need to be more informed. You need to be better informed. So being a leader in a, is, a, is a big responsibility in a group. And it also shows how much you've learned and how much you know. Students become resilient. They can take those knocks. They can fail. Because failure or making mistakes teaches us so much. If you never make a mistake and then suddenly you're a young adult and something goes wrong, you have no method. You have no tools to survive. You have no tools to deal with it. Making, mis making mistakes is absolutely fine. As long as you know that that's fine and that you know how to put it right, you have the skills to get out of it. And for me, that's what resilience is. It also teaches students to be responsible, to be responsible for themselves, to be responsible for others, and also to be responsible for their education. Students need to value education and they need to be responsible for that education. We don't want children turning around and saying, well, I failed because I didn't do my homework because you didn't tell me to do it. Children need to think, I need to do that homework because that homework will help me pass that test. It also encourages independent learning. And independent learning is something that develops over time and it can, it can actually lead to so many other skills. And that's why collaborative learning is so important. But how can we collaborate if we can't actually see each other? In every curricula that I've ever worked with, and I've worked with curricula from all over the world, at the moment I'm working from a vast amount of curricula, and somewhere in the information it will always say that the responsibility of the teacher, of the educator, is to prepare students for the next stage. So if you're teaching kindergarten, you will be thinking about what, what are they going to do when they get to primary? What will they do when they get to year one? You'll communicate with those teachers to make sure that you're teaching what the children need to know in order to be successful at that next stage. When students are in the final year of primary school, the teacher, parents will be thinking about secondary school. When they're in secondary further, and further university. So every curricula tells us that our main focus or one of the main focus is to actually get children ready for the next stage. And that doesn't just mean content, that actually means skills. So many curricula now are actually identifying and promoting the skills that go alongside content because we know that skills are going to support students in the next stage of their education. So how can we collaborate? How can we collaborate when we social distance? Collaboration means sharing, being together. We can't do that at the moment. We can't do what those children are doing in that classroom, in that picture. But we can do this. We can sit next to a parent and we can work next to that parent or that responsible adult. A friend of mine is working from home. She has a four-year-old. She sits and does her emails. He tells her what her, his friends are doing online and she works it out. It's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy, but there are ways. 
some students always also want to write they've come to that stage where writing is actually becoming a joy it's no longer a challenge it's no longer a difficult task that they just have to learn because they have to learn it it is becoming something that they want to do so let's encourage that also but skyping online communication it is the best way for students to collaborate and keep in touch with the peers and the classroom friends so technology and good old-fashioned handwriting these are the things that i've been using over the last few weeks i've actually developed some techniques and some strategies and i wanted to share them with you because i'm sharing what children have actually done i'm not sharing ideas and research i'm actually sharing some real time strategies and techniques that children have engaged in over the last few weeks lots of parents lots of teachers contacted me especially about six weeks ago and they said there are only so many types of a worksheet that students can engage with a lot of students told me this they appreciate they appreciate the effort that teachers are putting into this I can't imagine how long it must take for teachers to research, download, print, email, send out these tasks and activities for children to engage in. And it's really important that children engage in these things. But there are only so many varieties of a worksheet that a student can engage with. This is what I was told. I was also told students need to work together. They need to collaborate. They need to communicate with one another. They need to share ideas. And then teachers and parents started saying, we're going to de-skill. We're worried that they are de-skilling. They can't collaborate. They can't communicate. They don't know how to work together anymore. What can you do about it? Meaning, what can I do about it? And in response to help, they cried, I came up with this. So I hope you like what I've done and I hope you can use it. This we call the communication tree. This is one of the first things that we developed. And this was for a local primary school. The primary school is very lucky because it's in an area that's quite, not rural, but there's, there is a bit of green space around the, the, the school. And the children missed each other. One day these children were in school and they were preparing for, for a, a public holiday, a school holiday. And they were preparing lots of activities leading up to the holiday. They went into school and by lunchtime, that was it. We were in lockdown. They didn't have time to say goodbye. They didn't have time to give each other the parting gifts for the holiday. They didn't have time to say how they would keep in touch. They literally went to school, that was it, they went home. So we came up with a method for children to keep in touch with each other and also the teacher. A teacher in primary school, as you know, plays an incredibly important role and children miss the teacher. And it occurred to me that we've built bonds between children, which makes school life easier. And the bond with the teacher is also making life easier. So what could we do? We asked permission to use a tree and we called it the communication tree. And there's a, a big banner on it, which says which class, class, Mrs. Green or whatever she's called class. It didn't really matter. There are several of them now with different class names. There are messages to each other. Um, and because they're allowed daily exercise, not every day, but once or twice a week, maybe they visit the tree. On the tree, there are all sorts. There are little gifts that they leave for one another. There are messages, cards, birthday cards, pictures, uh, and little gifts in little plastic wallets, all hung on the tree for the children to communicate with one another. It occurred to me after this that this had been really successful because the children were actually writing things. The children were actually making things. And the children were engaging in quite a lot of activities that they would normally engage in at school. And they were sharing these with the friends and this classroom teacher. And it occurred to them that not everyone could go out globally. 
and not everyone would have access to a tree or a safe place where they could leave things. And so some online platforms were set up as well. But I must really, you know, it's really important that these online platforms and everything that we're going to discuss from now on is set up by parents. It's controlled by parents. Children, we're not encouraging children to go online or to even send an email. We're asking children to tell parents and parents to do that aspect of it. They're responsible for it. So there are some online trees as well. One of the messages in the orange on the orange piece of paper says, I miss my friend George. And I think that's sad that he's missing his friend George. But actually, he's remembering his friend George and George is remembering him. So when they go back to school, hopefully they will be looking forward to seeing their friends rather than being worried about going back to a place that they've forgotten. This little boy is four years old and he collected stones as young children do. There'd been some construction work near to where he lives and so he started collecting stones and then one day he decided he would paint the stones which was great, great activity, fine motor skills, painting stones. Because they went for a walk every day for some activity, mum decided maybe it would be nice to give stones to his friends, to leave little presents for his friends. So she made a, a very basic chart or diagram or simple map of the area. And he hid stones in certain places and she recorded it on the map. He checked she recorded it properly. And so therefore he was actually engaging in something quite complex. They left the stones and he told her what to write in a message to all his little friendship group that was set up in a, in a, on email. So the emails were actually to, via, through parents. And he, told, and he told everyone where the stones had been placed and he shared the map with them. As children found stones, they emailed, said where they found the stone and what kind of stone it was and sent pictures of the stone that they found. Mum kept a record of all the stones that have been found and every day she said they sent out messages saying, sending clues so that everyone could find their stone. And it'd be little clues like three steps from the road, uh, three steps from the road, four steps from the tree. So actually they were becoming quite complex communication with other people. Eventually after about a week, they'd all found their stones and they sent a message to say, all the stones have been found. Well done, everyone. Let's think about the next activity. They collaborated. They actually worked together to an end solution, to an end result. They actually helped each other find the stones and they all found the stone. The problem solved. How many steps is it from the road? Is it four steps from the road? It's five steps from the tree. It's actually under a leaf. And they also communicated the children communicated to the parents, the parents communicated to other parents and the parents communicated with their children until all of the stones were found. Not only was it a nice thing to do, but actually they learned quite a lot from it. I'm not a lover of Facebook, simply because I'm old school and Facebook is a little bit <laughs> I don't really get it that much. But in these times and modern times, we have to use Facebook. This is a nursery from a nursery that I actually worked with. They started this idea. So this nursery already has a closed private Facebook account. And it was initially used so that nursery teachers could send video footage or messages throughout the day to parents. It was especially useful for children that had just started at nursery or for children who were not settling in very well or were having a difficult time. And the photos and videos were reassuring for parents and really useful. But when we came into this quarantine and isolation, it, it actually took on a new, new role. So parents were encouraged and invited to send pictures of activities and pictures of things that the children had been doing and engaging in uh, during this quarantine. 
at the end of the week the teacher picked at quite at random I say at random it's very odd that all the children got turned so it might not have been quite at random but it, it potentially was at random and then they would have a what Rhina did this week there page and on that page would be lots of different pictures lots of different video clips recordings all sorts of different things that all the other parents and children could then view this is becoming a long-term diary or journal of what has happened during lockdown which would be great i can just imagine graduate graduation children looking at what they actually did during this few weeks um, and it's also become um, a platform for sharing ideas so some parents have said to me sometimes they'll look at this Facebook and think that's a great idea I know that my child can probably do this because his friends his age group have actually engaged in this activity and they've enjoyed it and oh but they said that part didn't work so maybe I could try this instead so they're actually developing ideas based on other people's experiences another parent quite honestly said to me it had become difficult to come up with more activities it was becoming a challenge to actually continue to de develop ideas and be creative and imaginative and maybe it had become easy for children to watch tv watch a video play on a tablet and so what this page has actually done as well is, is sort of inspired and enthused parents to be a little bit creative and to not get into that rut of this is too difficult i can't do this anymore it's almost been um a little bit of a boost a bit of a encouragement to carry on and be creative and come up with different ideas I also like this Twitter idea and actually when I, I, I did choose select two pictures to actually put on this slide and though the children have given me permission to use the pictures something as a teacher as an educator as someone who works with children stopped me from actually publishing it I just thought it's not really my place to put a picture of a child and share it with, with anyone with you or anyone and so I removed the picture just this morning but i still wanted to share this twitter idea with you because when i actually was looking for pictures to share i realized that there's there was 35 at the time but there's well over 35 schools that have actually set this twitter account up since the beginning two two three months ago and so it obviously is popular and it obviously does work so children just post events it's not a daily thing they don't have to do it at a certain time they don't have to put so many on a week just when they do something or they want to share something it's been particularly popular with children who are actually still attending school so we have a lot of key workers that children of the key workers are actually attending school as normal but there are very few of them that feel very isolated so what we've encouraged them to do through Twitter is to share the activities that they've actually been engaged in during their school day which has also given the children who are not in school a view of what's happening in school school is still real school is still there school hasn't gone anywhere school will be there for me when I go back and there's my teacher that's my classroom and so it's given children at home a real insight into the real world that the school really does still exist and they've shared lots of different things and then the children at home have got in touch with school and said can we do that can we achieve that can we get involved in this can we do that activity and so again it's really inspired people and children and parents to actually want to do a little bit more to do something different so twitter is fantastic but it is a closed account and it should just be for people that you know and that you want to share information with i was then asked about science tasks now i was just putting something in the boot of my car and somebody said excuse me are you an engineer which was very odd and 
but they knew that I'd got an engineering background because of some of the books I'd written. And they said, we want to be engineers. Will you help us? Because some of the things we're getting from school is not really for proper scientists like us. That impressed me. It impressed me that 14 year old boys thought that they were a cut above because they were proper scientists and they needed support from a proper scientist like me. And that was it. I've really enjoyed doing this, I have to say. And this has been one of the best things I've done through this uh, quarantine time. So each week I set a challenge and it's a science challenge. It was directed at the 14 year old boys. This is one of them. What materials are being explored to make the screens in aircraft? Who, where, why, when? Didn't take me long to write that at all. So they're in a peer group. We start, I think there was about eight of them when we started out, eight 14 year olds. Obviously brothers and sisters, siblings at home, they needed to help. So they got involved as well. So it soon multiplied. Then other people found out, and I think in one of the groups is about 40, which is not ideal, but that's how they want to work. So they get the task, they look at the task, they research it, and then they have a pool of information. So via parents, they then email each other. So they email their peer group, their ideas. They then amend, add, communicate, collaborate together, work on it together. Mm, that might not work. Have you tried this? Let's look at that. When they are all in agreement, the team of engineers will send me their reply or their answer to whatever problem or task that I've set for them. So this is the boys in action. So there they are, they've, they've printed the task out. They've made sure it's all been shared with their peer group. They've now started researching, the writing, jotting the notes down, getting some ideas together. They'll then share these ideas with their peer group and then eventually when they're all in agreement, they will send something like this. That was it. Still, this took about a week. The answer was still. But they also said that the reason that they needed to invest in research for new materials was because birds crack the screen and this can ground a fly, which is very, very expensive. So metals, including steel, have been developed to actually make a windscreen. They were fascinated by this because steel is not transparent, but this steel is. They also were even more interested when they found out that NASA had actually developed this idea. And so they started looking a little bit into other things that NASA had developed and were fascinated to tell me that, did I know that disposable nappies were actually were actually developed by NASA for astronauts. So it also inspired them to look at other things and they complete this task every single week. But the younger brothers and sister, sisters wanted something for themselves. So now we have another group of children and this is one of the tasks that they were given. Now I set this task because as a Budding engineer some years ago, someone asked me this, why does a screwdriver, why does it have the shape of the handle? And for me, I quickly found out why. But actually, if you, I challenge you, look, look, try and find out why a screwdriver has that shape of an handle. And I couldn't find anything. So for the nine year olds, with the help of their brothers and sisters, to come up with this, based on their research, a picture, just a picture. So William and his friends age nine researched my question about a screwdriver, emailed each other, and they decided that this picture, so they'd gone away, they'd found the equipment, they'd set it up, they'd make sure that it did actually work. So not only had they found out the answer, the problem solved the answer, but they'd also tested it. So they also, tested if this actually does work, if it's real, and yes. So for me, when I received this picture, it's not just a picture, it's more than a picture. For me, 
And this demonstrates communication, collaboration, amazing research. Because I now know how difficult it is to research it, resilience as well. They carried on and they found the answer. And then I'd thought way back, right at the beginning, I thought keeping a diary or a journal would be a great idea because we probably, hopefully, never, ever, ever live through time like this again. And it occurred to me that in future years, this would be really interesting for children to look back at. It'll be interesting for our children's children to look back at because it is such an unusual time. And I thought some children, younger children, making a photo diary would be really, really easy and it would be good fun to do. And so this is a day, just one day, I admit probably a busy day. Maybe this is a, a, a beacon of the best that can be done. But during the morning, they planted potatoes. During the afternoon, they had craft time. Really like this craft time. It's a long roll of paper. They draw on it, colour on it, paint on it, stick things on it, do collages. And then it, they just roll it up. So by the end of it, it's an absolutely amazing piece of art. So this is a photo diary of one day during lockdown. He also records. So alongside the pictures, he communicates his ideas about what he did, why he did it, what the outcome was, why he enjoyed it, if he enjoyed it, and they share it. So they're compiling an electronic diary, which they then share. He sent it to his school Facebook account because he was so proud of what he'd done. And the school have actually adopted it. And other parents and now are also sharing their ideas. And they're making a, a, a school diary, which again would be lovely to share in future years. So Logan and his friends are making part of history, really. And I think that's a, a lovely thing to do. And they have been completing this for just over two months now. It's still ongoing. Lots of other schools have also taken this on board. Photographs, recordings, fantastic way to communicate for four-year-olds. And they're really enjoying it. And again, it's also inspiring parents because parents are looking at this and taking ideas from it, using ideas and sharing that with other people. So it's a big, massive domino effect. Lots of people are getting involved in it just because of that one person two, two and a bit months ago. But this little girl, Phoebe, she's six years old, but she's, she's, she's bright she's, and she's a studious type of child. She didn't want to keep a photo diary. She wanted to keep a journal. So she writes her journal most days, uh, I'm told. And she writes a little bit in her journal. She enjoys writing. Writing's no longer a chore to her. Writing had just become to the point, as I explained earlier, where she was enjoying writing. And it occurred to me that when children get to that stage, they actually process their thoughts and they process what they're thinking whilst they're actually writing. And so writing for them is not only educationally very important, but it's important for their development as well. And so uh, we, I encouraged that, but then she was frustrated because everyone else was sharing by email or Facebook and, and she was writing it in a journal. She also keeps a scrapbook and she wanted to share the pictures, the things she stuck in her scrapbook. And so we just thought, well, take a picture. So she takes, she writes the journal, she fills the scrapbook in, she takes a picture, she sends it to a teacher she also shares it with a family Facebook account, which is really nice. They've got family from all over the world. And they're an international family. And so they're sharing, she's sharing her daily life with people from across the world, with relatives that are living a completely different kind of quarantine. And so that's really nice as well. This is one of the science challenges that was set to a group of children. It's it's interesting because this group of children are a long way from me. Um, I, I have no physical contact with them whatsoever. They're a hundred miles or this school is a hundred miles away from me. 
um, but I set them challenges as well. And because we got some sunshine, which is most unusual in the UK, I decided that they should look at shadow. Shadow is, is a massive part of every primary curriculum. Uh, observing shadows, understanding shadows, looking at opaque materials to create shadows, a big part of the curriculum. And so I thought, well, we'll use shadows. So the task was that they had to submit the best picture of a shadow, but it, they had to justify why it was the best picture of a shadow. It's not just a picture, oh, a shadow, I'll send it in, I'll win. This is the one that was voted on the day as being the best shadow. And their reason for it being the best shadow was because the shadow is big and the very dark, which is great. But they are good reasons to be the best shadow. Unfortunately, all the other children who submitted pictures of shadows didn't quite agree that this one was the best shadow. They thought their shadows were the best. And so they wanted more evidence and better shadows. And this is what the winners came up with, and everyone agreed on this. Apparently, this proves that shadows are the best. Now, let's listen to their reasoning. So, we've got a four-year-old and a six-year-old who actually submitted the winning shadow picture that everyone agreed on. Let's listen to the reason. It can be measured. They've recorded it. And the friends, when they're walking on their daily exercise, can come and check it. Is that not extremely scientific? It can be measured, it's been recorded, and it's been shared with other scientists, and they can add their opinion to it. Lots of the friends came to visit and all agreed, couldn't question, they were the best shadows. Let's look closely at these shadows for a moment. I'm quite suspicious that some parents might not have been involved in the creation of these shadows. If we look closely, I think we'll find, and I've had since had this confirmed, those shadows are actually coloured in with charcoal. So yeah, <laughs> they were measured and they're recorded for quite a long time because they're actually coloured in. So when they walk away, those shadows actually stayed there. Is it a problem that parents got so heavily involved? No, that's fantastic. That's amazing. That's exactly the kind of collaboration that we want. Parental involvement in an activity that was great fun, but actually really scientific. So then one of the young men in the group, in the in the kindergarten group actually, well it was nursery, nursery group, he actually sent out we decided, let's have a creative, let's have a creative um, challenge. And so we thought, in response to this, that children might tell us a fantastic story. What would you do if you had superpowers? There are a lot of boys in this group, by the way, but that's not being sexy. And we assumed that the, that the children would come back with something like, I would do this, or I would fly to the moon, or I would go to another planet. This is the kind of things that we thought would inspire them, inspire these creative thoughts. And actually, one child came back with, I can fly over the rooftop, rooftops, can you? So we said, I think you need to prove this. But we did make sure that the parents were fully involved in this challenge. And, um, and he did. And this is what he sent back. He is indeed flying over the rooftops. There he is in his Superman pose, and there are the rooftops, photographic evidence that cannot be argued with. It's great fun, as it should be. Learning should be great fun, but actually extremely creative and very, very, very imaginative. And all the children who were involved in this, older siblings, started talking about things like, um, is it actually... Um, are the sizes right? Should it, would it need to be smaller? Should the buildings be bigger to make it more realistic? So it did actually inspire some fantastic scientific um, questioning. Remember, at the heart of inquiry-based learning is a question.
if the question comes from the learners, it is, and I quote, powerful. Children looked at this picture, adults laughed, which is great fun, and the children looked at it and started questioning, y yes, but that's not actually right, because, and that is inquiry-based learning. Now, sometimes we need to do some formal learning and we need to assess how much has been learned and what children actually know. And there are lots of different ways to do this. Some children do just want to sit quietly and learn. And some parents really want the children to sit quietly and learn, especially if they're working from home. I've also used some other things that children can sit quietly and get on with. And these have been sent to me. So I've collected some of these. And it's clear to me as an educator that it's not just the four-year-olds or five-year-olds or the six-year-olds that have been involved in this. We can tell that some of them are quite sophisticated, which means they've been collaborating with siblings. I think a lot of the time siblings don't work together. S siblings very rarely have the time to help each other and to work together. But actually, I think that some of these relationships have been reformed during this quarantine time because actually they're the only people that they can talk to, that they can communicate with other than parents. And it's clear from this activity, what I did was I looked at some of the key words from the primary curriculum and I asked children to come up with collages that represented those words. So in other words, it's a working definition. I don't believe in defining words until the words have been used. And so, this is what these represent. So the first one was, I came up with, um, how do offspring grow? And this is something they came up with, children. So they've got lots of pictures of children developing what children do, and then that led into families. This one must have been supported by an older sibling because it was time. And if you look at that for time, you've got the 24 hour clock, you've got PM, AM, you've got watches, clocks, stop watches. And I think that one, although it looks quite simple, it's really, they've really thought about what time actually means. And that one's a really lovely one. This one was eyes. We were thinking about sensors and this is eyes. And they've got, look, because that's actually what you do with your eyes. And they've got as many things as you can think of to do with eyes. And again, that clearly has been worked on, not by just one age group, that's, that's across stages. This one was when we're labeling the, the human body, labeling the face is often a little bit more difficult. And we've got on there, we've got lips, mouth, and teeth. The only thing missing was the tongue, but you know, it's getting there. But it's interesting that they engaged in it and they worked together and collaborated on it. I also developed these some years ago, and I don't know if you've come across them, they're called the Max Science Inquiry Boxes. And I thought, hmm, that's a good idea because they're a little bit different than a worksheet, but actually, there are some assessment questions on them. So you can actually assess the learning that's going on. There are some really great properties of these as well, the white proof. So actually, these are new ones. The ones that I've been sending out don't look like this. <laughs> the, the, the well used. So what I do is I clean them with a sterilized white, put them in a plastic wallet and I post them. The children have a go at them they create something and send the response and then for a little bit of exercise they clean it they put it in another plastic wallet and they post it to the next person they like them they tell me they like them because they're different they're a nice size they're handy they're easy to use they're nice and smooth it's good quality but they also tell me that they're really colorful they're interesting they're different and they're not too big. It doesn't look threatening. This one is actually about the states of matter using particle diagrams. It's actually quite advanced science, but we've got children at a very young age 
five, six, all having a go at this. And do you know what? Getting it right because they're collaborating. They're collaborating with older um, siblings and they're working together and they're actually achieving some fantastic science. We did this one. They love this one. This one's got lots of optical illusions on it. It's actually was linked to um, the sensors, sight, seeing, how well we've adapted, how different animals have adapted different ways of seeing things. What this one, it, they enjoyed it so much that it led to lots of research. We've had so many different optical illusions sent in um, that we're actually going to make a little bank of them and share them out and let schools use them because these are made by children for children. So children must be interested because they think it's interesting. And they've really engaged in this. Lots of age groups, parents have looked at this as well. Because we're coming to the end, we think, children are now making musical instruments. So we're thinking about sound. We're making different sounds. They're really enjoying uh, getting a tin box or a, a metal tray and dropping things from a certain height and predicting how loud things will sound. They're loving that. I'm not sure parents are loving it, but the children are loving it. And that's led to this. So they're making musical instruments. So when eventually we can socialize together, students are going to hold a little concert. So we're, we're, we're having a concert using the instruments that they've made during lockdown. Again, collaboration is leading to competition. I'm not sure competition is an inquiry based skill, but it's certainly producing some fantastic results and some great resources. There are some other resources that I really like as well. Some um, of the ones about sensors and sight, they come from the uh, Macmillan resources as well. I like these about five sensors, doing star jumps with their eyes closed, uh, eating food with your eyes closed. There are also the journal pages. These are really good for, um, I think, assessing if children are actually learning anything and how well they're learning it and is it identifying any misconceptions. But some of them, you know, um, are quite straightforward and everyday things. So you don't actually need to be a teacher to be able to use these. These are actually quite straightforward. Children do like writing journals, I think. Uh, Phoebe has just demonstrated that, that she's actually asked if she can write. So let's be aware of that as well. This is a great one, PE and Science. This one's actually written, and the, and the one that comes next as well, the next slide, actually written with younger children in mind. But actually, I'm being told that older children and siblings are engaging in this and really, really enjoying it. And push and pulls seems to be very easy. Um, low academic skill but actually ask anyone if you kick a football is it a push or a pull if you hit use a racket to hit a ball is it a push or a pull now these open up fantastic discussions and forces are an extremely difficult concept for children to engage with because you can't see forces you can see the action of a force, but you can't actually see the force. And so because you can't see it, children find it difficult. So this is a great one to get siblings working together to collaborate and to figure out some of the more complicated or challenging aspects of science. I actually love these. I've used these so much. I was introduced to these not that long ago. I feel passionate about teaching reading skills. Some of the recent research tells us that reading is the only way that we can extend our vocabulary. If you look at the latest curricula from around the world, across curricula, the vocabulary has extended massively, especially in science. Some of the vocabulary that used to be high level science is now expected to be understood and used in primary schools. If we don't teach children to read, they're going to find it very difficult to understand and access some of this vocabulary. I've used this technique, making these into uh, little spinners using um, 
toothpicks or pencils. Even non-readers, children that are really not interested in reading, this actually works. They spin the spinner, it tells them a task to do before they read, while they read, and after they read. Some of the questions that you can use, and we're not suggest and we're not suggesting you use all of the questions. I suggest you use one question. I suggest you think about before reading and talk about before reading. Use one, two questions during reading, one or two after reading. Certainly not all those. That would be that would become a challenge. That would become a test. It's not it's not intended to be a test. It's intended to encourage a love of reading. This is my final message and shoot me if you want. But if all we do during quarantine is develop a love of reading, develop an actual taste for reading at whatever level that might be, then we've achieved massively. We have succeeded. If we can support our children in reading, wanting to read, and being successful, confident readers, we have moved mountains. Everything else is a bonus. And that is my final message. If you've got any questions, I'll be absolutely more than happy to try to answer them for you. I hope you can use these strategies. I hope you've enjoyed looking at real life strategies that children have engaged in. These are not just an educator's ideas. This is evidence of the children that I work, have worked with from all age ranges across the world have engaged in these activities and strategies. And I just wanted passionately, I really wanted to share these with you. And I hope you can use them and that other children really enjoy them. I hope you develop them further and I'm sure you will. So thank you for your time. I enjoyed that. Thank you so much, Debbie, for the um, really, really great ideas. We delivered a session earlier this morning and I said to Debbie that I would want to try these um, activities on my own. I don't have children <laughs> at home, but uh, I think I'd just try them on my own, particularly the shadow one. We've got some definitely some sunshine in the UK at the moment. So uh, thank you so much, Debbie, for that. Um, sure. While we wait for any questions, if there are any, please feel free to write them in the questions box. Um, if not, then feel free to email us with any comments um, or feedback. In the meantime, uh, previous recordings and the webinar for today will be available uh, on our YouTube page. So do have a look at those as well. Um, also follow us on social media for updated information. And we do have a home learning content page, which does have um, literacy, maths and science resources, particularly catering for the quarantine time that we're facing at the moment as well. Um, CPD certificates and the PowerPoint presentation will be available within three to four weeks via email. So please do um, be patient with us a little bit because we do have webinars running um, every few weeks at the moment. If you would like information on um, upcoming webinars, do look at our website for further information as well. So um, I don't see any questions, but just a lot of thank yous for Debbie, of course. Um, so I think teacher, uh, teachers or parents or both are finding them super informative, engaging and simple strategies for great learning. So thank you, Debbie. Oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. I hope you all did and take care. Definitely. So we'll hopefully see you all soon. Um, please take care of yourselves and stay safe. And hopefully we'll see you soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Bye. Debbie. Bye. Bye.